Hi, welcome to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Kabir Segal. Kabir is the New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author of five books and has written for Market Watch, The Street, CNBC, Quartz, and Zero Hedge while making appearances on nearly every news channel. Today we'll be discussing his new book, Coined, The Rich Life of Money and How Its History Has Shaped Us. Kabir was a VP at JP Morgan and is a Grammy-winning producer. Let's ask him five good questions. Welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Kabir Segal, author of Coined. Hey, Kabir, thank you for speaking with us today. We appreciate you taking the time out. My pleasure. Really an honor to be here. Okay, so Kabir, first thing I got to tell you is that uh, I really enjoyed your book. It's it's like one of those books that reminds me why I like reading books. Um, <laughs> That's great. It, uh you know, it's it's this uh, sort of a history of the world as told through the prism of money and all these different characters that you maybe have heard of, but you just didn't have as much background on them. Um, I, I thought it was great. I love the, the multidisciplinary approach that it had. Thank you. So you ready for five good questions? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So question number one, uh, most histories of money imply that it came about as a way to uh, transition from bartering. Uh, so, you know, there wasn't, it, it eliminated the coincidence of wants. So you didn't have to trade someone one thing, you know, one physical object for another. And money kind of served as this in between, like go between. Mm-hmm. Um, your, you put forth an interesting alternative theory that uh, perhaps it evolved more from debt. Can you explain that a little bit more for us? Sure. In most histories of money, um, going back to Adam Smith even going back even further to Aristotle, there's an idea that we all sort of learn about, which is bartering led to money. If you take economics 101, they'll say, where does money come from? It came from bartering. You have an apple, another person has an orange, and then they trade, and that's when, when that happens enough times, money gets created out of that to replace bartering. And so anthropologists have gone back, um, David Graeber, also an anthropologist at Cambridge University, has gone back and looked at this and said, well, wait a second, Bartering is what you do when you don't know the person, right? So if I'm, I'm from one tribe and you're from another and I'm, I'm never going to see you again, then we can barter and we can do the deal. But this one anthropologist says, well, look, there's actually never been a society in the history of the world that's ever existed, which is a pretty emphatic statement, <laughs> that uh, in which bartering was the principal means of exchange. And so she says, well... The principal means of exchange was debt, social debt, basically doing favors for each other. And because if you, someone, you know, came, um, you're living, let's think about ancient evolutionary history in caveman days. If someone like killed a game, some bison, and did not invite you to feast with them, I mean, the day would come, you would be hungry and you would not be invited to the hunt uh, or invited to the feeding session. And so this whole idea of gift economy and doing favors for each other, social debt, is our primary type of currency and is sort of the history of all from that. In ancient Mesopotamia, the first types of currency were loans documentations, like financial loans. It's not until about the 7th century BC until coins were invented. So let's put that in context. You have thousands of years of history, 4,000 BC, 4,000 years ago, um, 6,000 years ago rather, yeah. that... Um, that financial loan documents, basically, you know, social debt transferring into financial debt is circulating as a primary means of money in exchange, whereas coins are invented thousands of years later. So there's a new theory for you that money is really a measurement of debt. Hmm. So question number two, um, there's this sort of what you described as a Faustian bargain, which I thought was an interesting way of putting it, um, that that many societies have made as they've transitioned from a hard money to a soft money. And this, mm-hmm. this goes throughout, you know, multiple, uh, different societies, whether it was Kublai Khan in China to John Law in France to, uh, you know, closer to home, Abraham Lincoln and Richard Nixon. So all of these different leaders have, have made this particular Faustian bargain. What do you think the specific danger is moving from a hard money to a soft money? And then as kind of a follow-up to that, um, do you think it's possible for the U.S. to ever go back to a hard money like a gold standard? Uh, the, uh, the follow-up is probably not because the genie has sort of left the bottle and uh, it's, it'll, be much, it'll be very difficult to get back to a gold standard or something that circumscribes the quantity of money that we can issue. 
And uh, the reason for that is because governments like to control the creation of money. In order to learn about this, I actually did not write about this in the book, but I went to the middle of nowhere to learn about paper money. I went to Mongolia. And why did I go to Mongolia? I was there, I was, you know, hanging out with a family who lived in a yurt. I went to the capital of the ancient Mongol Empire called Karakorum. There's almost nothing there there, nothing there right now, because um, the empire is no longer. And what happened? So Kubla Khan swept into power. He invaded the Chinese. And 60 million people joined his empire with the Chinese edition of China. Um, and he didn't have enough silver to back his money. So he started to cut that link between money and metal. And he said, basically, if you do not trust my money, I will kill you. Or if uh, you counterfeit this money, we will put you to death. And so he started to realize that his, or basically he understood that his money was kept together by fear, right? And so what happens is he started to print all his money, spending picked up, which led to a depreciation in the currency, which led to inflation overall, and then there's a monetary crisis and then a financial crisis. And so what happens time and time, I've looked over 5,000 years of monetary history, what happens time after time is governments try to spend too much because the the contrary to that is they would have to tax citizens. Right? You have to have right. to tax people to raise money. So instead of taxing people, which almost never wins, yeah. um, you say, I'm just going to sort of rob the value of money um, that everyone has. And so if you look at today, we came out the gold standard in the early 1970s, and the dollar has lost about 80% of its value since the early 1970s. So what if the government said we're going to pass an 80% tax? It would never be approved. But silently, quietly, and in the middle of the night, uh, your money gets robbed of its value. Yeah, that's uh, it's pretty amazing that uh, they figured that out, and it's still <laughs> happening today. I mean, even the fear part of it, you could argue that a lot of the U.S. intervention probably worldwide is to maintain a, the dollar as the reserve currency, especially priced in oil, you know, oil priced in dollars. Um, it's funny how yeah. history keeps playing out. Yeah, Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, it just rhymes, right? Yeah. And... Um, if you look at if you look at um, Mayor Rothschild, one of my favorite quotes in, in my book is talks about I don't care who uh, writes the laws as long as you give me the power to make money because yeah, control that's sort of money, yeah, yeah, yeah. control the money because that's really what matters at the end of the day. Yeah. So this is a follow up question to that for question number three. The since the U.S. went off of the gold standard in 1971. Um, <clears throat> The national debt has really unhinged since then, um, and has just proliferated. Uh, you know, it went from about four hundred billion in the early nineteen seventies to now, depending on, I mean, whose official count you take. But I looked at the CBO, and it was like eighteen trillion, mm -hmm. uh, which is like about a ten percent annualized growth rate, um, which is that, over that many years is turns into obviously pretty big numbers. Uh, how does credit fit into money uh, debt and? And this, are they the same thing? And is there any cause for concern that we should have about having so much debt out there? I mean, we're, there's more debt today than there was in 2007. Like nothing has really been deleveraged. In fact, it's like quite a bit worse. So what, uh, yeah. I mean, should we be scared, more scared about this? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, this is, I think about, I, I traveled to over 25 countries in my research, my job. I was at JP Morgan. I got to travel around the world. And I saw almost universally people think about money as a measurement of debt. So just as you think about a kilometer or a mile as a measurement of distance, think about money as a way to measure debt. It even says it on a dollar bill on the back. This is ten legal tender for all debts, private and public. So uh, to your question about concern, of course, it's very concerning about the explosion of, of debt. Uh, but I, would, I should say something that, you know, there's a reason. And it's, it's gotten this way, and that's because, you know, we enjoy the benefits of borrowing against our future income. I mean, if you look at from the 1970s, our um, standard of living has increased dramatically in, in terms of, like, technology, you know, our health care, um, sorry, life expectancy has grown, literacy, um, some other, our financial literacy has, you know, it's it's gotten a little better, yeah. And so, but there's a point where it gets too much, and is not only is the debt problem right now it's just the growth is not there because you know in the 90s we were growing briskly so we could sort of uh, right. have the debt under control yeah we could borrow against it the easiest way to get rid of the deficit is to grow 
And unfortunately, we're not growing. And I think that's because of large globalization issues, because, you know, the, the, the middle class is the wages have been stagnating. Um, jobs have been shipped overseas, the automation of jobs. And so I think it is sort of like a new normal, you know, 3%, maybe 4% max. And that's not enough to grow us out of out of um, this trillions. huge debt hole. Yeah, trillions of dollars, which we have. Uh, unless the, unless we ship to like a more manufacturing economy and, and we start manufacturing for other countries in the world. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. So uh, question number four, and this... Uh we talked a little bit about this, about monetary authorities and their unwillingness to give up the, that power. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. it's a hugely powerful thing. Do you think that it would take a do we need a full collapse for or some kind of a reset, you know, uh, to ever have something like Bitcoin really take hold? Because um, otherwise, you would imagine if it got popular enough, they might just try to make it illegal um, <laughs> because like, why do you want to give up your your stranglehold yeah. on it? Well, Bitcoin today is. I think FBI has 10% or 15% of all the Bitcoin supply just from like seizing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think there's like a fundamental understanding of what Bitcoin really is. Don't think about Bitcoin so much as a currency. You see that on the news. Bitcoin is trading at $500, trading at $1,000. Uh, Bitcoin is really a technology. And it's a way to, to uh, transfer files, essentially. I mean, the whole reason all these leading venture capitalists are so excited about Bitcoin is not because it replaces the dollar, but it allows you to sort of transfer files in a, in a seamless and decentralized way. A quick example of this is, let's say I wanted to send you an MP3, not a copy of the MP3, but the actual the file, the ownership of the MP3. I can use the Bitcoin protocol, it's called the blockchain protocol, and then transfer that file to you in an authenticated manner without going through a central party. So what are the implications of this? The implications of this are... Any central power, a bank, a broker, uh, who sits in the middle of a transaction, they risk having their business you know, taken away from them because they can use Bitcoin. And I think the biggest application of Bitcoin is going to be in the emerging world. Last year, I was in Saudi Arabia, and I met a Filipino, a lot of Filipino maids in Saudi Arabia, and they have to take their money and they, they send it, they remit it to the Philippines. And I said, how much do you pay on that transaction? She said, 15% in Western Union. See, that's a lot, Brutal, a, yeah. a lot of yeah, a lot of drag on, on a lot of friction. Actually, more money is spent on remittances, uh, the, the fees of remittances are than an international um, aid. And so, using using Bitcoin, what what they could do is, she could convert from local currency into Bitcoin, and then someone in the Philippines can convert from Bitcoin into the local pesos, and she would save fourteen percent, if not more. And there's already a big ecosystem of Bitcoin companies that manage the risk. And that's why you see things like Silicon Savannah, like in, in Kenya, like a lot of investment into Bitcoin payments. And so Bitcoin payments in the emerging world is going to be sort of what, what I see as the future, the immediate future of Bitcoin. Yeah, I know um, there's an interesting book by uh, Hernando de Soto that basically talks about why capitalism works or doesn't work um, in a country. And a lot of it comes down to property rights. Um, and so if you have... Bitcoin as a way or that protocol, whatever the blockchain protocol is, as a way to uh, function as that tr the trust, basically, that is, you know, comes from the, the standardization in the U.S. I mean, it took us a, a hundred years to get this figured out, you know, title companies and things like that um, yeah. that, that just did, don't exist in South America. And, and just that that infrastructure, um, if you can kind of fast forward a little bit on with that infrastructure using the technology uh, there's really exciting things for the emerging markets to to have better property rights and and uh, and hopefully maybe like bring them up a little bit in the the world. Yeah, that's a good point. Like he talks about dead capital, um, this right. sort of being a trillion dollar opportunity. And you know, his book, I, I, I mean, someone should do an op-ed on that of like the mystery of capital is really can be unlocked by Bitcoin. Um, that's I might have to write that article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so question number five. Uh, how can neuroscience help us better understand our own money behaviors? So when I first started writing this book, I, um, well, I just started working at J.P. Morgan months before the credit crisis. People were losing their jobs. People were losing their houses. I asked a question. I asked, what's going on in the mind? What's going on in the brain when you deal with money? And that's a physiological, it's a biological question. 
And so I started looking, and there's actually a field called neuroeconomics. These are brain scientists that scan your brain while you're making financial decisions. And, you know, they found things like they, they scan the brains of people about to make money, and they compared it to folks who are high on cocaine. And they found that they're indistinguishable, um, that, you know, money amps us in a way and excites us neurologically. Even one study shows that money is uh, more, more exciting than dead bodies and naked women for men, Yeah. right? And so the whole point here is that um, there's actually genetic and biological um, inputs to how we make our decisions. So there was a, one study of identical twins and separated over long periods of time. They found that even identical twins, when they're given an asset allocation decision to choose between stocks and bonds and cash, they invest their money in a similar manner. And these are identical twins who share the same genotype, they have the same genes. Yeah. In fact, in, an, in another study, which I know in my book, there's a gene that we have that's evenly, there's two variants of it that's, that are evenly dispersed within the population. And uh, one of the variants leads people to have uh, more risk-seeking behavior. Um, and to the tune of uh, about 97 points on your credit score. So about 20% of your credit score can be influenced by your genes, your genetics. And so you don't often hear that, but the moral of the story is if you're not with money, you can always blame your parents because it's their, <laughs> their gene pool after all. How long before you have to uh, get a DNA swab of your financial advisor? You know? yeah, exactly. All right, so we always ask our bonus question, and this is for a book recommendation. And it's usually something that is maybe a little under the radar um, or that you think it just hasn't gotten its due recognition. Yeah, um, I think the book is Second Nature, and it's by Haim Ofek. And, um, and I'm trying to lose this. It's, it's basically a look at how exchange is really a biological uh, function. And it's, it's not really on any syllabus for economics. I mean, I started my book in the Galapagos Islands exploring how energy is really a form of currency. And it's, it's nature's form of currency. And Mr. Opec, Professor Opec, goes into this in such detail. He explains how fire, controlling fire, was so important to our evolutionary aspects. He really, he really answers the question, why from an evolutionary standpoint, why from a biological standpoint, do we exchange? And his answer is really because it helps us survive. But the way he t tells a story is quite magnificent. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds great. It kind of sounds in the uh, the line of some of Matt Ridley's work yeah. um, and that I've always found fascinating. Yeah, he takes, he does, actually, think, uh, I think Ridley quotes OPEC From, yeah. in his in Rational Optimist. Yeah. And, and actually, the, either Rational Optimist or The uh, Origins of Virtue, he quotes, he quotes OPEC. Yeah. Well, Kabir, we really appreciate you having on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. All right. Thank you.